Thank you, Matteo. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about recording from the same cortical neurons over months uh, with NeuroPixels probes. Compared to NeuroPixels 1, NeuroPixels 2.0 probes have a dense linear geometry, as you can see here. And another, another advantage is that two probes can be connected to a single head stage. And so uh, the weight of the two probes and the head stage combined is less than one gram. Uh, so that's really uh, useful if you want to record in small animals such as mice. Um, probe uh, comes in two versions, one shank or four shank. And in the four shank configuration, uh, it's possible to select a horizontal stripe of channels. If you want to record from a structure that is uh, wide and shallow, such as, for example, visual cortex. Um, for our part of the study, we wanted to see if we can chronically record the same population of neurons across long time scales. So, um, with all the advantages of uh, Yo's method, we still did, didn't want to use uh, explantable probes. We wanted to be as uh, stable as possible. So that's why we um, cemented the probes to the cranium, as you can see here. And we use this 3D printed protector to make sure that the probe doesn't get damaged when mouse runs around in the home cage. And we inserted these um, probes in the left visual cortex. Um, we continued to record our animals for more than two months, uh, for more than 10 months in some cases, and uh, the firing rates remain stable throughout this time, as you can see on this slide. So here I'm showing on the x-axis days since implantation and on the y-axis uh, depths on the probe, and the color indicates the firing rates in spikes per second, and the fact that these uh, black lines are essentially horizontal means that um, recording is stable across all these months. Um, and, Anna, um, there's yeah. a question that just came in and I think it helps if you explain it. Does it mean that this is for one time use that you cannot reuse the probe? Yes, that's right. So this is the disadvantage to the method that uh, Yo just described. Uh, but um, on the other hand, you'll see in the next few slides that uh, this provides a very, very stable recording. So uh, yes, yeah, so this is one, one time use. Cool. Um, so on the right here, you can see example cluster from this day 198. So seven months after implantation, and you can see that uh, units are still quite good. Um, to quantify the stability of the recordings, um, we plot here total firing rate versus days since implantation. And as you can see, it remains stable for 250 days in this case. Uh, and also uh, here we plot cluster count. It changes, so you can see, you can appreciate how much it changes here. <clears throat> so we observed that the spiking activity across different days appears to represent the same pattern, but it is shifted in depth. So here each plot means a spike, and x-axis is time, and y-axis is depth. And you can appreciate that the uh, lines here are sort of similar, but uh, shifted upwards from one day to another. So in order to combat this, Maris Bahitariu modified KiloCert algorithm that uh, I'm sure you heard about already. Um, and um, he made it so it's possible to track and correct for this movement. And now let me explain what we did next with this diagram. So we want to see if we can record from two neurons uh, and in two sessions that are separated in time. For this, first we record visual responses in these two different sessions. Then we splice together these two recordings. Then shift in data is corrected using this modified kilosort algorithm that I mentioned. Then neurons are matched across days and we don't use visual responses for that we only use waveforms. So it's usual QLSART algorithm. And then we do ground truth validation. So matched neurons, algorithmically matched neurons, uh, we check them using the visual responses in these two sessions. So let me go now into that uh, last step in more details. So in order to do this, we had fixed mice in front of three screens. And we demonstrate a battery of 112 natural images five times in each session. 
And we do this across months. So during each session, we demonstrate this battery five times in random order. Then we- so sorry, By demonstrate, you mean you show it to the mouse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So then we uh, quantify the responses and we uh, get something that we call uh, units fingerprint. And let me describe what I mean by this fingerprint. So on the left here, you can see responses of a particular unit to three natural images on two consecutive days. And as you can see, it, bear, it doesn't respond to the first image. It responds a bit to the second image and it responds a lot to the third image. So we can plot all of the responses to all 112 images of this neuron on day 14 and day 15, and we can color code it. So red color means high response, blue color means no response. And then by combining these visual fingerprints of all units on day 14 and day 15, we get these response matrices. And hopefully you can uh, see that they are similar across these two days. So uh, we then assessed whether we can uh, uh, whether the algorithmically tracked units that are uh, returned to us by Kilosort actually represent the same neurons by determining whether these uh, visual fingerprints are correlated across days. So here you can see the result of that process on two consecutive days on the left and on two days divided by, uh, separated by two weeks on the right. And hopefully you can see that most units lay in the diagonal with only few exceptions. What this means is that uh, the visual signature of a unit is more strongly correlated with the visual signature of this same unit uh, than to the visual signature of its neighbor. And um, we use this uh, neighbor characterization because it's a known fact that uh, in visual cortex units have uh, responses unique amongst their neighbors. And using this, uh, we can then estimate the percentage of stable units in the whole population. So in case we took recordings that are 16 days apart or less, shown here, we can successfully track 91% of neurons. And if we take recordings that are three to nine weeks apart, we can still successfully track 65% of units. And with that, I would like to conclude. So first of all, NeuroPixels 2.0 probe has adapted site geometry. Kilosort 2 has the ability to handle shifts in data. As the result of this, we can track the same neurons across days, weeks, and in some cases, months. We used only a pair of recordings for each period of time. And uh, we anticipate that if we use intermediate recordings, it will further improve the stability. And this opens up new possibilities for studies of learning and plasticity because it allows to record from same neurons deep in the brain across time. And I would like to thank all of the uh, people who contributed to this work uh, across different labs and different countries. And thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer questions. Yay. So Anna, in this setup, you cannot see people clapping, but you can see us clapping. So there is a question from Stefanos that actually will probably lead you to explain a bit better the fact that you have spike sorted sessions together. And because the question from Stefanos is, do the waveforms for each cluster remain stable or do they change through time? And I think this question indicates that Stefanos didn't catch the fact that you spike sort things together. So things have to have the same waveform, otherwise they wouldn't be called the same spike. But do you want to explain how you do it? Yeah, exactly. So, so if we return to this, um, to this diagram again, so essentially what we do, we record neurons separately on two sessions. Then we splice the two sessions together. And at that point, it may be that um, neurons are not matched. But then this new algorithm that Marius developed, it basically shifts the data such that the uh, shift um, between days is minimized. And then we run usual kilosort algorithm that is based on waveforms. So it detects neurons from the second part such that they have similar waveforms to the first part. 
And this is what the algorithm tells us is the same neuron. But we're not sure, may, maybe the algorithm is wrong. So we wanted to check that. So this is why we compare then responses of these neurons in the first part, visual responses, to the responses of units that Kilosort tells us are the same neurons in the second part. And we see that they are highly correlated. Cool. And um, so um, there is a question from Quinn Lee. Um, could this approach be applied also in areas where some representational changes are likely to occur or where representations are abstract? For example, hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, et cetera. Right, so we were hoping that this study will provide sort of um, ground truth validation of the new method of um, kilo sorting. So basically for us, we had a ground truth data set so we can check whether or not this algorithm returns same units, in fact. And so if you have an area that doesn't have these functional signatures, such as visual responses, or in hippocampus, you could use place cells, for example, to check whether you're still recording the same unit. But if you're recording from an area that doesn't have these straightforward functional uh, signatures, you can still rely on the fact that if your recordings are separated by um, nine days or less, then you will still have the same population, almost the same population. Okay, um, there's th three very good questions here. Do you think that the stability that you reported is underestimated by this method of using different visual stimuli? Because m m maybe, this is Tom Flossman, who wonders if maybe neurons actually change their visual responses. And so by, if you see a change in visual responses, you say it's not the same neuron, but maybe it is the same neuron. Yes, this is correct. So this is a lower bound on stability. We also get rid of the units that have more than fourfold change in firing rates across the two sessions because we think that it may be drift or something else. So we get rid of them, but it is in, in fact possible that this is the same new unit. It just changed the firing rate across. Cool. Days. And how stable is the waveform amplitude over time? In a way, you, you, you already explained it that if you say that two neurons are the same across 90 days, they have the same waveform. But how, how similar is the waveform across those, you know, 30 days or two days or 90 days? Yeah, I, um, I think I, I think at some point I plotted them. They are very similar. So I plotted uh, two waveforms in two different recordings on top of each other. They are similar, but I didn't do any kind of yeah. quantification. Just, just to, to remind people, kilosort here is asked to spike sort two sessions together, if the waveforms are different, it's not gonna give you the same cluster, right? It's gonna give a different cluster. So the waveforms are staying very similar, but there's a big difference in this method relative to the previous one. Here, the probes are glued in, cemented in. Um, okay, is the stability, Maria Diamantaki asks, is the stability that you reported a characteristic of the NeuroPixels 2 or of the implant in slash implantation procedure? Have you tried the same implant with NeuroPixels 1? Right, so yes, we did try the same thing with NeuroPixels 1. I think NeuroPixels 2 provides better stability because of the fact that the units and the uh, electrodes are separated by 15 microns and they are um, linearly aligned. So this is the big advantage because if your unit, for example, drifts upwards, then in NeuroPixels 1, you may lose it in between uh, electrodes, versus with NeuroPixels 2, you will be able to pick up the signal just on a different channel. As, and with our stabilization algorithm, you can correct for that drift. Are you equally good at tracking excitatory and inhibitory neurons over weeks as you rely on visual responses? How many neurons have you lost at the end of this procedure for two consecutive days? So we didn't, we didn't characterize whether or not these urine units are excited or inhibitory. We just uh, looked at the whole population. There is some loss of neurons to answer the second part of the question. So for example, here between day 14 and 15, you can see there are more than 400 units versus uh, when you take day 15 and day 36, you can only see 260 units or something. So there is significant loss if you take recordings that are further apart. Um, and for that reason, I think it would, in hindsight, it would probably be logical if we wanted to record neurons over, um, so, uh, to, to compare two recordings over two weeks, 
it would pr probably be wise to record every single day in these two weeks. And then because the uh, unit loss is minimal, um, if you take two consecutive days, this way we could probably track more units, uh, even for recordings with a um, uh, long time between them. Okay, and, and uh, I think we have a couple more minutes. Um, Christian asks, how does your ability to track cells across days look when you plot against spike amplitude of firing rate? That is, are you better at, you know, tracking cells if they have a big spike or if they fire a lot or something like that? Um, yeah, um, I think it's a general kilosort question, right? Like, is kilosort better at tracking uh, neurons that spike more. I think it is. Um, okay, so, so definitely if we fire more, Kilosort will have more stuff to work with. And how about the spike size? Because Christian also thinks that it might go the other way around, suggests maybe a, a, a huge spike is a sign of a neuron that is too close to the probe and it's gonna die. Um, have you noticed any difference between the spike amplitude and durability? Uh, oh, to be honest, no, we, did, we didn't look at that. Oh, but it's a good idea, we should look. Okay, and then Alexandra asks, well, a similar question. If there is a relationship between stability and metrics of cluster quality, like amplitude of firing rate, but now if you ignore amplitude and firing rate, which you've already answered, is there any idea of a metric of cluster, cluster quality that you could use to figure out whether a cell is gonna be stable or not? Uh, no, like I said, so we didn't at all look at the at other uh, characterizations of of the units except for their functional properties, and we probably should. 